So, hi everyone. Um, thank you for listening or coming to my talk. I hope you're having a great conference. Um, so, a lot of people ask me about my Vim setup. They see me, you know, streaming and all this sort of stuff. Um, hang on, I've just got a message. Double check. how I set up my NeoVim to compete in a world of heavyweight IDEs. Um, so basically, I love to make things. I love making things in the garage with tools like, you know, hammers and drills and saws and all this sort of stuff. Um, but I also love to make things with code where I use tools like Vim and Git. And like with any tool, whether you're in the garage or on your computer, it's important to maintain your tools and keep them sharp. Hang on, I'm getting a lot of messages. I'm going to double check. No, all good. Go, go, go. Cool. I am going. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's important to keep your tools sharp, maintain them, and look after them. So I love Vim because it gives us a rich language to describe the changes we want to make on a file with things like text objects, and motions, all these sorts of things. But Vim's not an IDE. It's just a text editor. So it doesn't have a lot of features like language aware autocompletion, um, jump to definition, all these sorts of things. But modern Vim, uh, it it gives us a lot of these things, partly thanks to Microsoft with things like the language server protocol. So just a bit of a disclaimer, Vim configuration is very personal. This is just what works for me, but I hope that it inspires you. So I'm going to give you a bit of background. Hang on, I'm getting a lot more messages. No, nope, still good. Cool. Um, Vim config is very, very personal. This is just what works for me. Um, but I really hope that this inspires you to just tinker with your tools and, you know, optimize things for your workflow. So some background about how I got to the Vim of my dreams. So what I want to do is show you my uh, previous Vim config. So if I come to this file here, I'm going to zoom out really, really far and then kind of like scroll down quickly. And like, you'll see there's lots of sections that are commented out. It's really long. It's kind of like all sorts of different sort of code you can see. It's ridiculously long. Um, I think I was tweaking this for over about 10 years. Um, it's 1500 lines long nearly. Um, and yeah, I just didn't feel good about it. Um, the structure was really messy. And then when I discovered things like language server and all these sorts of things, the config just got worse. So I want to share with you the steps that I took to get to the Vim of my dreams. So uh, step number one is to commit your dot .files. So if we come over here, this is my public dot .files repo on GitHub. If you don't know what dot .files are, they're just um, configuration files. Typically, they start with a dot on Unix systems to make them hidden. Um, so you can see here, uh, I've committed about 600 commits. This is over about six years since I started committing my dot .files. And committing your dot .files helps you to keep a history. It helps you to share your uh, config with other people. It helps you to share between multiple machines. And it also helps you to set up new machines. So I use this thing called .bot to uh, automatically create symlinks from my dot .files repo into uh, like the correct places on the system. But there's tons of other tools you can use to do this. So this is just the one that I like. So that was step zero. So step one is, is to declare config bankruptcy. I made this cool little thing here. Oh, let's zoom out. So this is Michael Scott from the office. It's, you know, I declare bankruptcy. And really that's just a funny way of saying to delete, or to, yeah, to, to start fresh, right? Like get rid of everything, clean slate. Now that doesn't mean to actually delete things, just move things out of the way. In my case, I knew I had some good nuggets of config, but it was just so hard with all the mess and noise and everything around it. So in my case, I renamed it, as you can see, to uh, vimrc.old. Now, step two is to configure your terminal. So I prefer to run Vim in a terminal. Uh, it's usable in more places. Um, it's in the same places I use a lot of other tools like Git and all those sorts of things. So when you're running in a terminal, the terminal becomes the foundation on which Vim sits, and it can affect a lot about your Vim experience. Things like the um, 
like the the fonts, the line heights, um, even the performance, um, all those sorts of things. So I really like this terminal called Kitty, which I think most people probably know about by now. Um, it's GPU based, it's very fast, um, and gives me a good Vim experience. So if I go to my Kitty config, I have a very minimal config because I, I like a lot of the defaults, but out of the box, if I like comment this out and start up Kitty on its own, do like a list, it's, it's pretty ugly. Um, well, it's not, it's not too bad, but let's just say we can make it better. So the first thing is to find a theme you like. I really like this theme called Dracula. You can download a config file uh, from their website. And if I comment that out, start it up again, it's looking a little bit better. Not too bad now. Um, but we can make it better still. So I like this font, JetBrains Mono. I know it's a bit controversial to use a JetBrains font in Vim, but it's got ligatures, italics. Um, if you don't know what ligatures are, it's those cool things when like you type things like a skinny arrow and a fat arrow, it turns it into you know, different symbols and stuff. Um, so I quite like that one. I also increase the font size a fair bit and increase the line height because if I start it up now, I just like having that extra breathing room. If we list now, you know, you can kind of see what's going on. You lose a little bit of context, but I think that it's a good balance between having too much context and just enough to see what you're doing. The rest of it's all just minor settings, you know, rem removing window decorations and all that sort of stuff. So. Now we've got a good base on which to run Vim. So the next step is to configure Vim. So if I come back over to here, uh, I've created like a little empty Vim config file. So with my empty config file in place, I tried to get work done without any settings at all. And if you are coming from another editor or you're already familiar with Vim, you'll know that it's pretty hard to use out of the box. Um, there's a lot of things missing, even in NeoVim where the defaults are a little bit better. So the important thing that I wanted to do though was to like deliberately notice what I didn't like and to then apply those settings very deliberately, read the manual on you know what the setting was, find all the different options, and then just add that one thing and confirm that it did what I thought it did. Because in my previous config, as I said, I've been collecting it over many, many years. A lot of the settings were now default or I'd set them a long time ago and hadn't really looked at you know what the, all the options were. So in terms of structure, what I decided to do this time around was create these sections. So I imagined like the preference pane of like GUI software where you might have like general settings and key maps and plugins. So I kind of like mimicked that with the config file structure. Um, I then set myself a few rules. So I'll zoom this in a little bit. So my rules were to keep comments minimal. In my original config, I had tons of comments kind of explaining what everything did, but I realized that a lot of the stuff I could just find in the help. So keeping comments minimal uh, made the config a lot smaller, tighter, and feel you know less cluttered. Um, I had, one of the first things I did was added key maps to quickly get to my config file and to reload it because I knew I was going to be going in there a lot and tweaking things. And then, as I said, only add things when you actually notice something that you don't like about the defaults. And if it's a plugin, reassess the available options and read the documentation. Make sure you're getting the most out of it. Um, if it was something quick, I would do it straight away. Um, but otherwise, I'd make a note and then regularly make time to come back and you know look over that thing that was kind of annoying me during my day to day. Uh, so now what I want to do is take you on a tour on where I've currently landed. So if I come back to my dot files, I'll zoom out a little bit. Uh, let's go in one more. Where'd you go then? All right, so if we open up my init.vim, I switched over to NeoVim at this point, so I adopted the init.vim rather than um, vimrc, and maybe now I'll do init.lua, we'll see. So I'll start with settings. I'm not gonna go through all of these because most people probably know a lot of them, but I'll just touch on a few of the ones that I find really interesting. You can see I don't have all these comments. I used to have a comment on every single one of these. Um, so some, I'd, I'd set some basic indentation rules, obviously. Um, I didn't want to use like eight character wide tabs. That's just not my thing. Um, but I will touch on something shortly that makes this even better. Uh, hidden, like Vim's not, in my opinion, usable without this setting. I don't know why it's not a default. At least I don't think it is yet. Um, the sign column's kind of cool. Relative number, people probably know all those things. Um, 
Wild mode's a really interesting one. I kind of have to like read this a few times and reread it to understand what it does and define the settings I like and play with them all. List chars, though, is one of my favorites. So what list chars does, it allows you to, when you um, say in this case, I've configured it to show me trailing spaces. So if we zoom in here, it's kind of like drawing these trailing spaces, but it's not drawing spaces anywhere else. It's only drawing them at the end of the line. And similarly, if I put a tab uh, at the start here, it shows the tab, but I don't have it showing me like leading spaces. I basically have it showing me the things that I don't actually normally want in my files, um, at least under normal circumstances. So it kind of, yeah, makes this more obvious. I like setting a high scroll off. So this means that like, if I move my cursor up to the top, it can't go right to the top of the screen. It keeps it in the middle and gives me that nice amount of context. Um, use the system clipboard, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and you can see here, like these are the only places I have comments. And these comments are not explaining what this setting is doing. It's explaining why I added it. Cause that's the thing that I'm normally missing um, with things like this. It's like, why did I set it to 300? So I've left myself a comment for that. Uh, so that's, that's some settings. So let's go through a couple of my key maps. Again, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on key maps because they're very personal. Um, I love setting my leader key to space because it's the biggest key on my keyboard. It's the easiest to hit. The leader key, if you don't know, is basically your like personal namespace where you can put all your shortcuts, like all your key mappings behind that, you know, it's pretty much guaranteed not to conflict with anything. I also have sub namespaces. So like these ones here all to do with them. I prefix them with a V. Um, so this one here is really cool. Uh, this one basically just closes all my open buffers. So often if I'm working on a bunch of files to do a feature, once I finish that feature, I want to go back to a clean slate. So leader shift Q, close all those. This GF one I use all the time and I'll show you why shortly. So GF out of the box will, if your uh, file, uh, sorry, if your cursor is on top of a file, uh, like, you know, in your text file and you do GF, it'll open that file but only if that file exists on the system. With this mapping, which comes straight out of the, the um, Vim documentation, this will allow you to open a file even if it doesn't exist. So I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, quickly switching between Windows. I try and use the defaults for things as much as possible, but some things like window switching, I found that like I wanted something slightly quicker. Um, this one here, like I don't know why, but when you indent things with Vim normally, it like doesn't reselect things. So having that one is pretty essential for me. Some other cool stuff here, but we'll kind of skip past a lot of those. This one here is really cool. So on, on Unix systems, XDG open will open a file in like the default program. So if it's like a .html file, it'll open it in your default browser. Um, so this lets me, if I'm working on a markdown file or HTML file, leader X can open that file uh, in the default program. Um, so yeah, that's it pretty much for key maps. I do have more key maps, but that are uh, plugin specific but I don't put them in this main section. I kind of keep them separate, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, so plugins. For my plugin manager, I use Vimplug. Um, there's tons of other good ones. This bit here that's kind of a little bit gnarly is straight from the docs, and it basically automatically installs Vimplug if it doesn't already exist. And what I do here, the kind of thing I learned here that I really like is for every plugin, I define a separate config file for it. Um, so this helps me keep the config organized. It also allows me to quickly turn on and off an entire plugin just by, you know, commenting out um, the the whole plugin definition. And I was going to show you where I use GF a lot. So in one case where I use it, say I want to add a new plugin, uh, I copy an existing one and come over here. We'll change this to new plugin. I can go GF on here now and it'll open that file and I can start adding the config for that file in there which is pretty handy. So I quite like GF to do that. Um, all right, so in terms of like plugins, again, I don't wanna go over all of these. Anything by tprope should just be merged into Vim at the point, I think. Um, so a few that I wanted to sort of talk about that Vim is, again, it's, I find like Vim mode in most software sucks. And often it's because it's missing a lot of these things. So something like commentary, for example, Vim commentary by tprope, allows us to comment and uncomment things in a very Vim-like um, manner. Vim surround, uh, actually, I will also show you what these inside some of these look like. So if I go into like commentary, for example, this one's like really light. It's just the plug definition for Vim commentary, but I still, I wanted to have like that symmetry. I didn't want to have like some of these as plug definitions and some of them as config. So that's the decision I made for that. Uh, so Vim surround, 
Uh, this one's really good. This lets us like surround text objects with other things like single quotes, double quotes, and changing them, all that sort of stuff. Editor config. Where was that one? Editor config. So this one's really I was mentioning before about how I set some defaults for um, my indentation. There's a standard called editor config. It's like a dot editor config file, like a JSON file that lives, is it JSON? It's YAML, I think, that lives in the root of your projects you're working on. So I work on a lot of different projects with different coding standards, and most IDEs support this editor config standard, and this lets Vim support that as well. So if I open up a JavaScript file where it wants two-space indenting, this automatically handles that for me. Uh, FCF, I think most people probably heard of. The huge amount here I'm doing with it that's out of the ordinary. The only one thing I did want to talk about is uh, I've re remapped their files command. Um, a lot of people, so like files by default, I think just search as like all files in the current directory. A lot of people don't want to include um, like vendor files, node modules, all that sort of stuff. So they use the git files command. But the problem with the git files command is if you're not in a git directory, then it doesn't work. So I've modified files to use ripgrep instead, which will obey git ignore files, um, but it will work in any directory. And then I've created another one called all files, which again uses ripgrep, but it tells it to not ignore git ignore things. So if I want to search inside vendor directory and node modules and that, then I can use that. And I've bound those to leader F and leader shift F respectively. Um, not too many things here, you know, uh, show which buffers I've got open. Um, and yeah, so let's go on to the next one. So we saw in Kitty, I was using Killer as my theme. I also use it in Vim. The reason I like Dracula other than its colors, it's a true color theme. Um, I customize it a little bit, but the cool thing to show you here is this line here. So with the approach I've taken with these um, separate config files, I can't call color scheme Dracula inside this file because the Dracula color scheme is not available until right down here when we do plug end. So I've run uh, created my own auto command called plug loaded. So then when I'm inside uh, Dracula, I can hook into that event and load Dracula. So I use this in a lot of my different config files if there's things I need to set after the plugins like properly loaded. Uh, so that one there is pretty cool. Um, float term is another one I wanted to quickly talk about. So I haven't embraced Vim completely for um, like a lot of Vim plugins, I guess, for uh, things like Fugitive. Like I use Fugitive, but I haven't fully adopted all of um, like using Fugitive for everything. So I still like to drop down to a terminal a lot. So what I really like about float term is I've got a terminal that's just a key press away. It's persistent. So if I type stuff in here, I can kind of like get back to it really quickly. And yeah, that's what I use for, you know, getting Git, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that one's very, very cool. Nerd tree, I think everybody knows about. Anything I wanted to show in there that I thought was a bit cool. Um, I think most people have their binding set up to use nerd tree toggle. And nerd tree toggle, if nerd tree's not open, it will open it. If it's open, it will close it. But when it opens it, it just takes you to like the root of the tree that you're in or the last place your cursor was. So there's this other command called nurture find, which is way cooler because it takes your cursor to um, the actual file you're currently in, but you can't use it with toggle. So messing around with, you know, Vim commands and that, I eventually got a toggleable leader N that will automatically, if nurture is open, it'll close it. If it's not open, then it'll use nurture find to get in there so I can go leader n and it'll take me to this specific file there and leader n again and it goes away. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, polyglot's a very handy one in terms of making Vim a bit more IDE-like. This basically just expands all of the languages that Vim knows about and modernizes all their things. So I definitely enjoy that one, especially when I'm playing with like new languages that, um, well, new to me languages that I haven't gone to the trouble of installing specific plugins for them. So now I wanted to talk about the plugins that really give Vim IDE superpowers. So the first of these is COC. I think most people have probably heard of COC. Um, basically, which stands for Conqueror of Completion, in case anyone doesn't know. 
it basically gives you access to a lot of VS Code plugins. Um, it is, in my opinion, a fairly heavy plugin. It has its own plugin ecosystem, all this sort of stuff. Um, NeoVim does now support LSP mode, and I would kind of like to switch to that at some point. But at the moment, I find that COC is just easy to configure and has all the features that I need. But hopefully, at some point, we can uh, we can get rid of that. Um, so I do want to quickly demo some of the things, though, that I love about CSE. So I'm primarily a Laravel developer, which is a PHP framework. So if I come over to this demo project and open up this uh, post controller thing that I've made, um, if I move my cursor on this function, I can go Shift-K, and it'll give me the definition of this function so I can see what the arguments are, what it returns, all that sort of stuff. And Shift-K is Vim's default for like show help about what's under the cursor. So that kind of fits in with um, with standard sort of Vim. Uh, one of the biggest things I was envious of IDEs for was go to definition. And so I'd played around with things like C tags and all these things, but they never quite, it, it never seemed to understand the context properly. Like it would suggest the wrong thing or too many things. But with COC, because it's using language servers, it knows now when I go GD on here for go to definition, it knows the exact right file to take me to. Um, go to references is also super handy. So if I'm in this file and I want to know where this is used, I can go GR for references. And this uses FCF to show me all the references of here. So I can immediately jump to, um, to where this is used. Uh, and of course, CSC does really good uh, context where auto completion. So if I'm over here and I want to know, uh, already paginate, uh, I can do that. And then I can see all the arguments and everything to pass to that. Uh, another cool thing it does is a context aware renaming. So say this request variable here, I wanted to rename this. Uh, I can go and change this to something else. And sometimes it takes a little bit, but that's going to rename that everywhere. But it's smart enough to know that this one here is referring to this one over here. But if I come down here where I've got another request, it doesn't just blindly rename everything. Um, so yeah, I really do that. Uh, the other thing it's really cool with is diagnostics. So if I come back to uh, this request, where are we over here? So. I can have it set up now. So I've got this um, this drop block here saying that this should return a an array of arrays of strings, if that makes sense. So if I come in here and return an integer, I now get an error from the linter. And I've got it kind of showing in line here, but sometimes these, um, like, you know, if I've got splits open, that's too long. So I can go and also show the full details of uh, all the errors and everything it found with that particular line, which is really cool. And it doesn't just work in, um, you know, PHP. It's got support for all sorts of different languages. Another one that's really cool is if I come to, uh, what did I have? I've got like a post index or the HTML kind of template. Uh, I'm using Tailwind in this project, so I can type class and I can have access to all of Tailwind's classes in here. And if I move down, it'll show me the, um, the definition of that. And as part of the di diagnostics, if I come here and say MB3, I should now get a warning because it's saying that these two classes are applying the same CSS property. So that's really cool. Um, while I'm in here, actually, there's another plugin I use. Uh, what's it called? If I come back to here, it's like XML, text object XML. So in this project over here, I can go DAX and it'll delete the entire attribute that so yeah like this entire xml attribute uh, which is very very quick and handy um all right so that's enough about coc next one i wanted to talk about is projectionist so this is a tpo plugin but this is one that i don't think gets enough uh enough attention i guess so this lets us do quite a few cool things. So I've set up like a default uh, configuration file here for it, where if it finds Artisan, a file called Artisan in a project, then it'll use this config. And Artisan is um, Laravel's like command line tool, so it knows it'll be a Laravel project if it finds that. So you can see we've got this start and console. So if I come back over to uh, my demo project, 
if I'm inside this project anywhere, I can type colon start and it will start the development server for this project. And similarly, I can type console and it'll take me to the shell for this or the REPL. Um, one of the cool things though, and what I'm going to show you here is you can have a local projections file in any project. So in this case, this project, I actually want to use these as my console and start commands. So I can override that on a per project basis. Um, but the coolest thing about projectionist is if I'm over in this controller here, I can define what's called an alternate file. So if we look over here, I've got this app star controller and it's saying this is source file. The alternate file exists in tests feature and then this little bracket will expand to basically what this was. So if I'm over in this project, I can type colon capital A and it will automatically take me to the test for that controller as long as it follows the right naming conventions. And from the test, I can go the same way. I can go colon A to go back to it. I can also go colon AV and it'll open it in a vertical split. And this is normally uh, how I code um, with the test and implementation side by side. Um, so yeah, that's just made it a lot quicker to jump between those things that a language server isn't really aware of. Um, so yeah, that's projectionist. And then the last one I want to talk about that gives uh, more Vim superpowers is Vim test. So the best way to demonstrate this one is, yeah, is, well, the best way to talk about this is to demonstrate it. So if I come back to my project over here, I come back to the test for this, I can say leader TS and it'll run the entire test suite. And I've given myself a bug in this case because of the, some of the stuff I was changing. Um, so that's pretty cool. But I don't always run one the whole test suite. So I can go leader TF and it'll just run this one test file. But the coolest one is if I'm inside this test and I go leader TN for test nearest, it'll run just that one test. So in this case, it ran the one test. Uh, I might just uh, stop paginating for a second so we can actually see some green tests because green tests are more satisfying. There we go. Um, another cool thing is if I just run this test and then I come back to my implementation, I can run TL for test last and it'll run the last test. So I don't even have to be in my test file. I can come in here. I can kind of, you know, by doing my red, green refactor, TDD sort of stuff. And then just quickly at the speed of thought, run a test, which I absolutely love. So combined with projectionist, Vim test, COC, those things all gave me the, the Vim of my dreams. And then coming up with um, this sort of structured config file, I'm now only at 171 lines. Obviously there's a lot more lines in these files, but it's just, yeah, I love it. Um, so the only other thing I have in here really is just some miscellaneous stuff. I haven't worked out where else to put it. So yeah, one day hopefully I'll get rid of that. So final thoughts, um, Tmux is something that I absolutely love. So you may have seen, I've been jumping around between a few different projects. So like my dot files, um, the slides thing I've got here and that demo repo. Uh, so I've got Tmux set up with shortcuts to just jump between different projects. I use something that um, Primogen shared on YouTube a little while ago to make it really quick to switch between things. Um, so you can kind of see, uh, oops, sorry. You can see all my sessions open here with little previews of it, all this sort of stuff. So I definitely recommend checking out Tmux to have um, really quick ac uh, like access to different projects, especially if you work on a lot of projects, you can kind of get to them real quick at the speed of thought. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention non-Vim related is uh, configuring your window manager. So I hate things like alt tab, like I don't like hunting through and having to like think about how many times I've got to press it. So what I like to do is have keyboard shortcuts that'll take me to my commonly used app. So if I go um, super, which is like the Windows key, super two, take me to my browser, super one terminal, backwards and forwards. And in GNOME, this is really easy. Basically GNOME automatically does this for you in the order that you've got these down here. So in this case, this one's super one, super two, super three, so on and so forth. Um, so it's just means that I can, again, I can jump around between things without having to hunt. It's just a, the speed of thought, muscle memory getting me there. 
Uh, so yeah, that's everything. Um, I did prepare a small little, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, you can check out my dot files, they're public here. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs>